Let's turn again this evening to Mark chapter 14. And we're going to look at a short time at verse 14. Mark chapter 14 and verse 14. And especially these words near the end of that verse, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? This was his instruction as we read in that passage to those that he was sending ahead to prepare a place to eat the Passover. And as he gave them these directions, this was what they would have to say to the householder, to the one who, whose house they were going to use and uh, had this room ready prepared. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Sometimes it's the small words, even the tiny words in the Bible that have most significance or that have most emphasis in them and are filled with meaning. Well, if you look at this verse, these words, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? That little word that makes all the difference is the word my. Where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. Jesus didn't tell them when they went to this house that they would say to the man of the house, where is the guest room where the master will eat the Passover with his disciples? He didn't say, uh, say to the good man, to the uh, owner of the house, where is your guest room where our master can eat uh, with the disciples, with his disciples? The teacher says, where is my guest room? These were the words they were to use to the owner of the house, that Jesus, their teacher, their master, was saying, where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Now, that's a remarkable thing to say of somebody else's house. This was not the Lord's house. It wasn't a house belonging to any of the disciples. We don't know exactly whose house it was, but Jesus commissioned or requisitioned this particular room for his own use. And it helps us to see into the mind of Jesus at this very, very crucial time in his own ministry, in his own experience, and in, the, in relation to uh, the service, the work that he was carrying out on earth to accomplish salvation. It helps us to see how he was thinking, helps us to see the clarity of his mind, enables us to see what his mind was focused on, and how especially he wanted the disciples to see that this was actually about him. This was to be his guest room. This was to be where he entertained the disciples around this table at this meal where he would set forth in the elements that were used the truth about his own death. And it gives us important pointers as well in anticipation of the Lord's Supper, God willing, next Lord's Day, because there's much in this passage that we should carry with us in our understanding, in our application towards the remembrance of the Lord's death in the Lord's Supper, as we hope God willing to have that next Lord's Day. So let's look at three things in the passage. Very simply, we'll look at the host and we'll look at the guests and we'll look at the occasion. The host is Jesus himself, though it's not his house. As we said, as we'll see in more detail, he was making this a room for his own use. He was treating it as if it was indeed his own, his very possession. Of course, in terms of his lordship, it was anyway. But he's taking it as something that is now properly fitting for himself to use for the disciples. He is the host of what's going to happen in that upper room, that meal that they're going to uh, be engaged in uh, together themselves and the Lord. He is the host at that table. Secondly, let's look at the guests as well. Where is it? Uh, this my guest room, it says, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. The guests at the meal are specifically termed his disciples. That meant, of course, the twelve at that time. Where is it 
so that I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And there's such a lot of, of rich teaching in that itself, that it's not just for the use of Jesus himself, it's not for the use of the disciples without him being there, it's a guest room where he, as the host, will eat the Passover with his disciples. They together will share in this meal that Jesus is going to make of such significance, not just for them, but for the church ever afterwards, for the whole course of time. And then we'll look at the occasion itself. What was this occasion? What's important about this occasion? What is it that really marks out this occasion as being unique in many respects? And we'll see that it's an, uh, an occasion or the occasion of fulfillment, particularly where all the centuries preceding this, as they looked forward to the coming of the Savior, were looking forward to the event that is represented in this meal, the death of the Lord and the benefit to those who are his disciples spiritually from that death of the cross. The host and the guests on the occasion. Well, here is the host, first of all, and as we said, it's important that we see this is what he says. Mark is the only one who actually records this particular word. The other disciple, the other uh, um, gospels, rather, uh, don't have the word my. That doesn't mean that there's a contradiction between uh, Matthew and Luke uh, and against Mark. What it means is that they're recording this in their own way, and it's, it's no different saying, where is the guest room? Uh, whereas Mark is particularly concerned to record the fact that he said, where is my guest room? Where is the possess We're using this possessive, where is my guest room? In other words, he was leading them really to think of this as his occasion, that it was about him, that he was the central figure of it, that whatever the Passover had been in the past, and however much it had been uh, celebrated in the past and partaken of in the past, this was his occasion, this was about him, he was central to it, he was the main figure in the occasion, as he would show by taking the cup and the bread and uh, saying about them that this was about him. Where is my guest room? You'll probably know that uh, one of the most famous paintings ever painted was the painting of The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. There are so many things about that painting that are interesting, have drawn um, many people's minds to it over the centuries from the time it was painted. There are so many queries, unanswered questions about the painting and the way that da Vinci arranged the figures, the disciples are at the table, the table is shown as if uh, they're just facing you as you're looking at the painting, Jesus is in the middle, and on each side of him you have uh, four groups of three disciples, three disciples in each group, and each group is looking uh, at, each, uh, at itself or as it were discussing something in itself, and Jesus is seen to be in the middle with his hands outstretched towards the bread that's there. And interesting there, there's the figure of Judas clutching a little bag of money, and he's reaching out without looking, reaching out towards the bread, uh, unconscious that Jesus is also reaching out towards the bread. And of course, Jesus here in this incident revealed that there was one of them who would betray him, and that's the man whose hand is reaching out and clutching the money back to Judas Iscariot. But for all of these interesting facts, and the fact that the painting itself has painting experts of which I'm not by any means. But they'll tell us that if you look at the lines of the painting, the way the artists draw the lines towards the most important part, that all the lines and the way that they actually come to converge, that they finally converge in the figure of Jesus himself. And da Vinci obviously set out uh, the fact in his painting that this figure of Jesus is the most important facet and feature of the painting. But what da Vinci could never capture in a painting, though he's captured much. What he could never capture is the paradox of the situation. That Jesus, yes, he is the host, and he's seen there sitting in the middle of the table with his hands outstretched towards the table and his disciples on each side of him, but he could never actually capture the fact that while he is the host, he is also the servant. That while he is the king presiding over that occasion, he is also the servant of the Lord. He is also the Passover lamb. He is also the one who is going to be the sacrifice. 
He is the one who is servant for the benefit of his people. And that paradox, that combination of him being the son of God at the same time as being the servant, and him being the servant despite him being and continuing to be the son of God in our nature, no painting could possibly bring that out, but the word of God brings it out. And John and, and uh, the other gospel writers bring it out in such a way as makes it clear to us that while the king here requisitions this room, as we've been saying, seeing from here, uh, the word my really sets that out for us. Where is my guest chamber? Where is this room that belongs to me is, is really the meaning and the purpose of it. Where is my guest chamber? And yet, while that is true, while he requisitions this room, while he has authority as the king to requisition anything he likes, yet still, the fact of the matter is it's all about his death. It's all about his obedience unto death. It's all about giving himself to the death that his people deserved, to the death that God required for there to be salvation for sinners. Yes, he's the king, of course. He continues to be the king. And he continues through with this kingship in exercise, as we saw something of it last time, where... Uh, his kingship was not something that, uh, that he left aside, although aspects of it were not prominent. He didn't show his great power. He didn't show any pomp or any grandeur. What was to the fore was his servanthood. But he didn't stop and cease being the king. But he is here. Really, it's all about his death. The host is the servant. And nowhere is that better brought out. And I can turn your minds very briefly to John chapter 13. You know the passage yourselves very well, where he begins to wash the feet of the disciples in John 13, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart of this world, out of this world, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then you read this. During the supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said, You will never wash my feet. And then, of course, it goes on, and uh, Simon capitulated. He, be, he realized that he needed this as much as anyone else. But then you see, verse 12, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place. They were liable to pass over these Smaller details, if you like, about the garments, taking off his outer garments, putting on the towel around his waist. Then when he had finished washing the feet of the disciples, including Peter, he again uh, took off his towel, put back his outer garments on, and resumed his place. That is all symbolic. And especially because it's the Gospel of John, where there's so much symbolism anyway about Jesus as the Son of God. The symbolism there is powerful because it's symbolic of the Son of God that he clearly is in that passage, coming into this world not by ceasing to be the Son of God, but as it were divesting himself of the obvious garments of his sonship or kingship and tying himself to the office of a servant, taking what was then a sign of being a servant, a servant's towel, the towel that servants used when they were washing the feet of guests. That's what Jesus did. He took off his outer garments. He girded himself with a servant's towel. And that's theologically important. And when he had finished his work, when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer clothes again. What did Jesus do when the work of atonement was done? What did Jesus do when he was risen from the dead? He ascended to glory. He went back to be with the Father went back in our human nature, now risen from the dead, to take his place at the right hand of God. Well, here is what Mark is telling us as well in his own way. 
And it's all built into this little word, my. Where is my guest chamber? Where is the king's guest chamber? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And yet he is there to set out for them the reality of his death, the necessity of his death, the nature of his death as an atonement for sin. Now you apply that to the Lord's Supper, as we said. Because when we come to gather at the Lord's table, we're not coming to the church's table. We're not coming to the free church's table. We're not coming to Stornoway Free Church's table. We're coming to the Lord's table. And rightly and historically, we have referred to it as a church as the Lord's table. And the reformers onwards refer to it as the Lord's table. It's the Lord's table. It's his table. It's his occasion that we are remembering. And in the very remembering of it, it's still his occasion. What's set out on that table is representative of his death, the death of the king, the death of the Son of God in our nature, the death of the servant of the Lord. And we're taken back to this occasion where he was with the disciples and where you find that it is his guest chamber, but nevertheless, here he is setting forth the reality of his own death in it. It's all about that. He is the host at the table and they are his guests, but he is also the main feature of it being the servant. Come to the Lord's table. Who is the host? Not the presiding minister, even if he be the greatest, most renowned minister in the world. The host is the Lord. Isn't that what he said? Do this in remembrance of me. Who invites you to come to the Lord's table? It's not the Kirk session. It's not the minister. Though we try to make appeal to people to come to the Lord's table if they know the Lord, if they genuinely are Christ's, if they know him as their Savior amongst all their deficiencies and my deficiencies, amongst everything that still causes us uh, to accept the fact that we have sin and that we do sin daily. Nevertheless, the Lord has provided this for his disciples, for those who are indeed his people. And as he is the one who invites us to the table to do this in remembrance of him, he's inviting everyone who is his, every individual who is his, because this is his occasion. It's his table. If it were the table of the church, it might be somewhat serious if you left out attending to it or coming to it or in responding to the church's invitation if it was the table of the minister of the congregation, it wouldn't make much of a difference whether you actually accepted the invitation to come there or not. But by the fact that it's the Lord's table and being his table, it adds a dimension to it, doesn't it? So that if you stay away when you should be there, it's a serious issue. It then becomes something that you're doing with respect to the king himself and the occasion of remembering his death and of remembering the servanthood of Jesus. When we come to the Lord's table, we're aware that he is the host, the host who has invited us to come to the Lord's table. But nevertheless, it's so that we can focus upon the lamb who was sacrificed, the same Lord who invites us to the table, invites us to come to focus upon his death and the remembrance of his death in the bread that we take, in the wine that we take. All about him. Remember, it's not about ourselves primarily. Yes, it's of benefit to ourselves, but the glory is to him and the honor is to him. Where is my guest room? And as this, God willing, this part of the church, the front of the church, next Lord's Day, or in the seminary, wherever, where that will be set out as the Lord's table, this is what you and I need to hear as well in regard to the occasion, in regard to that place, in regard to what's marked up. It is his guest chamber where he's going to eat the Passover with the disciples, where he's going to be present, where he's going to meet with his people, where he's going to draw their minds to what's on the table and say this, I have done for you. 
Now do this in remembrance of me. That's the host. To remember him in his death, though he is the king, as he presides over the occasion. Secondly, look at the guests. Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He has given them the right to be at that table. They all come conscious of their undeservingness, their unworthiness. Peter, as we saw in John 13 in the verses that we read, was convinced that this should never happen to him, that the Lord should wash his feet. And as we've read and tried to bring out the emphasis in our reading of it, that's exactly how it is in the text of the Greek text of the Bible in that passage. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Peter was taken up with what seemed to be him completely wrong and completely in reverse. Why should the Lord take a towel and gird himself with it in the form of a servant? Why should it, how could it possibly be right that the Lord would come and bend and kneel before him and wash his feet? And of course, Peter came to understand afterwards how necessary it was that the Lord be the servant and that in his service the Lord come to give himself to the service even unto death that would result in his people's salvation. And we come to the Lord's table and we're conscious that we're not worthy of it. And that's never going to change, hopefully. We will never be able to say, coming to the Lord's table in this life, we will never be able to say at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, if we are privileged to sit there with the Lord's people, I am worthy of this. Don't wait until it comes to you that you are actually worthy of this. It's something that will never be. We are unworthy, unprofitable servants. But don't mistake that unworthiness for not having the right to be there. It's one thing to say, I am unworthy to sit at the Lord's table. It's another thing altogether to say, I have no right to be there. We are all unworthy of taking communion, of coming to the Lord's table. But the Lord's people can never say, without doing despite to the truth of God, I don't have the right to be there. Why? Because he has given you the right. He has given you the right because it comes with the right to be a child, a son, a daughter of God. Isn't that what John says in his, uh, his gospel? Isn't that what he says in the very opening chapter of the gospel, where he says that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him, speaking of the Jewish people particularly, but as many as received him, to them he gave the authority. The word means the right. Sometimes it means power, but in that context it specially means right. To, the, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become or to be the children, the sons of God. And he went on to describe who they were, even to as many as believe in his name, who put their trust in him. You see, along with all the other things that come with, through faith in Christ, not because of it, but through it, you come to be justified, you come to be accepted with God, Along with all that comes adoption. You're made a member of God's spiritual family. And you can say by the authority and by the action of God himself in saving you that you have the right to it because Christ has purchased the right for you. You see, when you come to the Lord's table and say, I am unworthy to be there, that's perfectly true. But don't say I don't have the right to be there when such a cost has taken place of purchasing the right for you. This blood, this death that you remember in the Lord's Supper, that's where your right comes from, not from yourself, not from any worthiness in yourself. To as many as received him, he gave the right to be the children of God. Have you received Christ? 
Have you embraced him? Even if you say that your faith tonight is a very weak faith, it's a faith that you'd want to be a greater faith, it's a faith that you want to be strengthened, a faith that you want more assurance in relation to, fine. Let it be so. It can be strengthened. It can grow and multiply. And it will do so through the means that God has given us. And the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is one of them, along with his word. And for all that we might say, our faith is very weak. And that we're hesitant. And that we're not as good as other people are. We can say all of that, even if all of that is true. The right to be at that table does not depend on your feelings, on what may or may not be true of your faith. He's given you the right to be a child of God. He's bought that right for you. Can you stay away when you consider what it cost to make you a child of God? Can you say it's not for me, even though I do know deep down that I'm a Christian? Where is my guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? A well-known figure in the island past, he was a simpleton, as you would say, in the best sense of the word, a very simple man who lacked uh, much intellect, known as Angus of the Hills or Innes Nemeown in Gaelic. And there's an incident recorded of him, an anecdote that he came to the Lord's Supper. He was a communicant, and as he was coming to the Lord's table, he was scabbling around looking in his pocket for the token that's given to ourselves to this day that you give and then admit it to the Lord's, uh, to the Lord's table. And as he was rummaging about for in his pocket and his waistcoat, uh, one of the elders said, Have you lost your token, Angus? Oh, he said, I've lost that little bit of lead you gave me, but I haven't lost my token in my heart. See, what he meant was, I have the only token that really matters. I have in my heart the evidence that I am Christ's, that he is mine, that he died for me that I have the right to be at his table. And so have you. To as many as received him, he has given them that right. Friends, he is the host who invites, and in fact, his invitation is actually more of a command, or as much as a, of a command as it is an invitation. This do is an imperative. It's a command in remembrance of me to everyone who has received him. You know, table fellowship in the days of the apostles and right through into the Old Testament, table fellowship was very significant to them. In the world of the day, table fellowship, not just in a Christian sense, but in the ordinary sense, table fellowship, being at a table with someone who was a host in a family or whatever, it was a sign of accepted friendship. Companionship, friendship especially. It was an indication of genuine friendship between the host and those who were at his table or her table. And that same principle carries through into the Lord's Supper. Being there, along with Jesus and his people, is an indication of genuine friendship, genuine love, which makes Judas Iscariot stand out all the more graphically when he is in the presence of the disciples as the betrayer of Jesus. The guests and the host, please don't stay away on the basis of what anyone else might say or think about you or what you might even think of yourself if you have received Christ and he is genuinely yours. Well, he has given you the right to be among his children. And that means to be among his children at his table too. 
And the occasion is an occasion really that's unique in many respects because this is the occasion of fulfillment on the part of Jesus himself. He has come here to fulfill all that was predicted and prophesied of him for centuries beforehand. Think of all the things that um, the Old Testament uh, uh, prophecies, the likes of Genesis 22 verse 8 where Abraham there is going up the mountain and Isaac asks him the question, uh, behold, there's the wood and there's the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And uh, Abraham replies in a way that's just so filled with meaning, my son, the Lord will provide for himself a lamb. Well, here it is. This is my body. This is my blood of the new covenant. And all the other passages, Isaiah 53 Psalm 118, verses 22 to 27, the one who was going to come in the name of the Lord, tie to the horns of the altar, the, the sacrifice, all that's to do with, these were psalms that were sung during the Passover, full of meaning. And here they are being fulfilled. Where are they being fulfilled? They are fulfilled inside this guest chamber, this guest room, where Jesus and the disciples sit down together in all the meaningfulness of this fellowship meal and where he will, as we read in the chapter later on, take the bread and take the cup and says, this is about me. This is me. This is who I am. This is my body. This is my blood of the new covenant. That's the occasion. The cross itself, anticipated in the supper of this upper room. That's what you have in the Lord's Supper, of course. The same cross, now being looked back on as they were here really looking forward to. That's the direct link to the occasion of our celebrating the Lord's Supper. The host is the same, the guests are the same, his disciples. The emphasis is the same. This is my guest chamber. This is my guest room. This is my body. The same action is actually invited. Take or commanded take and eat. But now it's looking back to the cross. Now it's after the cross has taken place. Now you have the benefit of knowing that he died that death of the cross. That the disciples here were invited to begin to think about and to understand. And so, when he invites us to come, and he says, this is my guest room, where I'm going to eat the Passover with my disciples, where you anticipate Jesus himself, through his Spirit, coming to be present on the occasion, and drawing our minds to the bread and to the cup, and saying these things anew to us, to reinforce the emphasis that he has indeed died for us, that we are his people, well, come and see. You know, the words of John, you find very often through the Gospel of John, um, where these words come and see are used of people that were either inquiring about Christ or wanting to know more about Christ. And on one occasion, Jesus himself, to the disciples of John the Baptist, who had left John the Baptist and started to follow him, and he asked them, where, where do you live? Where, where are you residing? Where do you abide? Come and see. That's what he's saying. If you really are the Lord's tonight, and you've never yet sat at his table, well, this is what he's saying to you tonight through the gospel. Come and see. Come and see what I've purchased for you. Come and see again who I am. Come and sit in my presence. Come and join the fellowship of my people. Come and be one of my guests. But he's saying especially come so that you will come and see the love of Christ. Come and experience the love that he has for you. Yes, it's there in the gospel. Yes, it's there in the word. But when you're sitting at that table with the disciples of Jesus around you, when that company of God's people sit there, when the cup is passed and the bread is passed and they partake of it, that really reinforces, as nothing else can, in a very graphic, illustrative way, the love that Christ has for his people and had when he died for them. That's what John 13 says, isn't it? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Then he took the towel. There's the evidence of his love. 
the actions of his servitude, the actions that led to his action and death. That's what's on the table. That's what's set out for you. And he's saying, come and see again the love of Christ. Come and see the evil of sin. Come and see how terrible a thing sin is when it took such a death as this to atone for it. Come and see that sin is something you can never treat lightly, that you can never ignore, that you can never see as anything other than serious. When the Son of God, in taking our nature to himself, came and died that death of the cross. Come and see sin in the light of Christ's death. Come and see the cost of your salvation. Come and see what it costs to purchase heaven for his disciples, for you as one of his disciples. Come and see at this table set out the defeat of Satan, the tormentor who comes to tempt you, who brings to your mind things accusing you as if you are not one of God's children, who will do his utmost to keep you from that table, who doesn't want you to come and remember the death of Jesus in the communion. Come and see his defeat. Come and see through what's represented in that bread and in that cup that Christ has thoroughly defeated Satan, that he is in chains to this Jesus. As Hebrews 2 puts it, that by death he might destroy him with the power of death, that is the devil. The devil's power has been overcome. The devil is not victorious and never will be. This Jesus is. And the Lord's table sets out that fact as well. The defeat of Satan, the evil of sin, the cost of salvation, the love of Christ. We could go on and on and bring out other things that are set out on that table and related to that table and are to be seen anew through taking communion and appreciated even more through taking communion. But come and see how much your life is worth to God. Come and see how much your life is worth to God. You know, you find people saying, our life, it's, it doesn't mean much. It's not very valuable. It's not something that God really sees as significant. I'm insignificant. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. I brought this on myself. I do despite to the will and to the law of God. All of that is true of me. Of the, the Bible tells me about my sinfulness. How can I be significant in the eyes of God? How can you be insignificant when the Son of God died for you? How can you see yourself as worthless or next to worthless if your worth is measured in terms of the blood of Jesus? No, no, God is saying to you, you're not insignificant to me. If you were insignificant to me, would I have sent my son into this world to die the death of the cross? Would I have put him and sent him to endure such sufferings as culminated in this curse that he became and was made, enduring the wrath of God? Come and see how much your life is worth to God. If you're a believer tonight, Christ died for you. He gave his life. He poured out his soul unto death. In his love, he did not hold anything back of what needed to be given. He gave himself so that you might be saved. And that there might be such a thing as a redeemed people of God. The host invites you. The host encourages you to come. Your fellow guests encourage you to come. Join with us, they're saying, as we remember the Lord's death in the guest room of the supper. And remember the occasion, the uniqueness of the occasion that this, this Lord's Supper marks. 
the occasion of fulfillment when Jesus accomplished all that he came to do. Where is my guest chamber? Well, may it not be said of you or of me next Lord's Day morning. May the Lord not be saying at that occasion, where is my guest that I invited to this table but has refused to come? May it not be so of anyone here who knows and loves the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, gracious God, we give thanks for all that you have achieved and accomplished for your people. We give thanks for the way that your word is so full of relevance and meaning in regard to uh, what our redemption is based upon and how it came about. We thank you for your love that has provided such glorious things for us to enjoy and for us to anticipate throughout eternity and to enjoy as well. We ask your blessing to give us, Lord, in our hearts that knowledge of you and from that knowledge of you, that desire to come to remember you in the supper of the Lord. So receive us now, we pray, and encourage us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's sing together now in uh, conclusion in Psalm 36. Psalm 36, it's in Sing Psalms again on page 44. Words that speak of the love of the Lord and also of how he gives us to feast within his house and drink from streams of God's delight. And surely we can apply that to the Lord's Supper as well as to other occasions where we gather in worship. Verse 5 through to verse 10. Your steadfast love is great, O Lord. It reaches heaven high. Your faithfulness is wonderful, extending to the sky. Verses 5 to 10 to God's praise. Your steadfast love is great, O Lord, it reaches heaven high. Your faithfulness is Oh. Uh -huh.
go to the main door again this evening. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>